Most, if not all of us, are fortunate to live where there are lots of different churches and groups of people as different local bodies of Christ. Praise God for all the churches who are standing fast, resisting compromise to be more like the world. It is a beautiful thing to see and realize how all followers of Christ, as led by the Holy Spirit, work together as He directs. It is not unusual for a Christian from one church to plant seed of salvation. One from another, water and even others work the soil. And yet another see the harvest of the person accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. And just to top it off, the newly saved person perhaps joins yet another church. Can we rejoice at the victory that is the Lord's? Amen. Hallelujah. We are working together, even if we're not trying, because if we are being obedient to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, He puts our work together to raise up the name, lift up the name of Jesus Christ. I heard a sermon that I want to share with you by the person who preached it, Dr. Tory Blackman of the Fellowship Baptist Church of Carabell, Florida. In this sermon is the best description of the essence of what God put in my heart with the vision of L4J Living for Jesus Bible Study Ministry. You're going to be fired up for Jesus after listening to the message. I thought about some of the aims of L4J, such as to seek and to be used of the Holy Spirit to lead people to accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Another thing is to uh, know that often people expect others to come inside the walls of a church to find Jesus. Praise God, that does happen. My conviction was that in addition to that, it is important to get out among the people, love them, and share the love of Jesus with people outside the walls of a meeting place. When they receive Jesus to guide them to follow the Holy Spirit to unite with a Bible-believing and practicing body of believers, a local church. An objective to promote Bible study in at least two ways are this. To promote Christian growth in individuals that are in Jesus. Secondly, to pre prepare fertile ground for the continuing work of the Holy Spirit in drawing the lost to Jesus Christ. Our first participants were not churched people, and most were distant from our Lord. Each one progressed at his or her own pace, some much more than others as it appeared. Professions of faith in Jesus Christ upon repentance resulted being forgiven, accepting Jesus as the Son of God, and being spiritually baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Those who were saved were encouraged to find a Bible-believing church to present for church baptism, encouraged them to tell people what was their experience, and normally this was not even necessary as the person is already sharing with everybody. Another thing is to realize that God brought others into the ministry who are very active in various local bodies of Christ. There were other Christian people who wanted to be involved in the ministry for the purpose of studying the Bible, but also in the purpose of spreading the gospel. They were drawn by an interest in studying the Bible, and many expressed an identity with taking, the G taking Jesus outside the walls as being something very important to them. It is most important to do no harm with a person's fellowship with the local body of which they are a part. We try to be careful about that. We don't want to harm anything. Do no harm. And then Bible studies are aimed toward Christian growth that enhances a person's positive impact on Christ inside and outside the church building and group. So if this is working the way we believe God led us for it to work. The people involved will be nothing more than an even better and a more positive asset to the church and to 
the ministry of Christ. L4J is not a church. It is a personal ministry of some Christian people who have felt led to concentrate on reaching out in the highways and the byways of life with genuine love and interest in people, lost or saved, who are among those we meet and provide opportunities to us to share the love of Christ in ways led by the Holy Spirit. Now, catch the essence of L4J Living for Jesus Bible Study Ministry in this sermon by Pastor Dr. Tory Blackman, and you are going to be blessed. And I appreciate you taking some time, and if you're in a hurry, just calm down and do yourself a favor and listen to this powerful message. You'll be glad you did. Just adding one thing, for the person who is going to church to find Jesus or to looking for something and happens to find Jesus, one of the most attractive things is for that person to see that the people in the church love each other. Also, from the standpoint of people out in the community, when they see people from various churches who all claim to be Christian people and followers of Jesus, when they see those folks love each other, it also is a factor that can be attractive in drawing them to Jesus Christ. Now on to the sermon. Because the sovereignty, his control, is not based on our circumstances. He's still God. I'm thankful for that. Again, a much needed, much needed uh, song that uh, blessed my heart. Know it blessed your heart as well. And it's just needed, just needed for our times. Ms. Joy was bringing up uh, just the uh, um, persecution that, uh, that believers are facing and will continue to face. And these are things that we preached on weeks ago on a Sunday night concerning the, um, uh, in the book of Revelation. And when we, now month, oh, this is last year, sometime we, we were going through the book of Daniel. And we were in the portion in Daniel where it was prophetic, chapter 7, and following in church. Uh, Joy had mentioned uh, Pastor Jack Tabir, North Valley Baptist in Santa Clara, California. They have a Bible college, and the church has been there since the 70s. And for decades now, decades, they've been uh, doing what this church has been doing, um, doing a work that contributes, contributes to society contributes to the very area and a week ago they were handed a uh, they were fined five thousand dollars and it was supposed to be five thousand dollars a day for having church and uh, the pastor received that fine and it was supposed to be every day and then they met back on a Sunday evening service just like we do and they were fined an additional $5,000. My concern was, well, I told my wife, you know, they have a Bible college. Are they going to do that for that one as well? And so every day that they're open, they're fined $5,000. And they're, so they were fined on a Wednesday night service and certainly uh, running their Bible college, which they will do. This Bible college has been faithful for the training and teaching of preachers, and teachers uh, across the globe, and again, contributing to society. They're not in a hot spot where they're at, but yet still they uh, deem that that's not essential for them to gather. I want to mention to you again, church, I mentioned this um, um, when we were in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 5, or excuse me, chapter 7, verse 25, the Bible speaks, of blasphemies that will be speaking against the Most High. Alright? It also speaks of that they would wear out the saints. Wear out the saints. Now, and the saints can be wore out multiple ways. It can be through rigor. Uh, more and more pastors and churches are closing their doors every year. And I come to think about that. Uh, you know, a church like us, if we were, if, if, and I'm thankful we're not, but usually what starts out west works its way east. But if we were fined $5,000 financially, 
we couldn't handle that here. Um, so let's pray again just for our nation. Then in that same verse, it talks about that they would change the laws, change the laws. And so these are things to look at. Uh, certainly this is future, this is prophecy, and uh, these things aren't happening in, in foreign countries anymore. We looked at that uh, a couple, uh, two, three weeks, Sunday nights ago, about the ten most dangerous countries to be in if you're a Christian. And we looked at that. I gave you that list. But let's continue to pray for this church, uh, that they would uh, continue. Uh, this pastor here and the leadership would continue to fall under what the Lord wants them to do during this time. Okay, it's very, very critical and dire and I'm thankful that we can gather we can still meet here openly uh, and there's no threat of persecution let's remember this church uh, let's look at Luke chapter 5 this morning Luke 5 in the gospel of Luke and um, we're going to um, begin reading in verse uh, verse 17 and following uh, let's see so we are on we are recording in Luke chapter 5 and verse 17, I'm going to read the portion of Scripture we'll be looking at, and then we'll go right into it and do the teaching and preaching. Scripture says in verse 17, It came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold... Men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. They found a way, right? In verse 20, and when he, meaning Jesus, saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts and he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or say, Rise up and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon the earth to forgive sins. And he saith unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately... He rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. A young boy, young little boy, entered in to a Christian bookstore. In that bookstore, the little boy approached the front counter and as best as he could, just stretched his head just barely over the counter. And the little boy asked the clerk, he said, sir, how much are your Bibles? The clerk looked at the little boy and the clerk turned around and he grabbed a children's Bible. You know, for kids. Ones with the pictures in it. And he grabbed that Bible and he set it down the counter in front of the boy's face there. He said, it's a dollar. The little boy reached into his pockets. He pulled his change out and he put it up on the counter there and he spread it out. And the little... And the, and as the boy looked and looked at the response of the man, he says, well, mister, he goes, I've got some more money in my sock. And he took his shoe off and he was taking his socks off and he emptied his socks and put some more change up there. And he looked at the man, he says, 
I don't have enough money, do I? And the man responded to the little boy and he says, Son, do you not have a Bible? And the little boy said, Oh, yes, sir. I got a Bible. He says, But my best friend doesn't have a Bible. You see, I want my best friend to know Jesus. And he said, well, if that's it, you can have that Bible. And the little boy took that Bible, and he walked out of that store, and before he left that store, he turned around to the clerk, and he says, Mister, this is a real good book, ain't it? And the clerk said, it's the best book there is. And you see, that little boy wanted to have his best friend Know all there was to know about Jesus. And that's what we see here in this what we just read. We see some men, faithful men, dedicated, loyal men, who want this man, this paralyzed man, who can't get up on his own, who can't go to Jesus himself. They want him to know about Jesus Christ. Boy, we look at this and we see right here as we've been going through Luke and going through the Gospel of Luke here, we see that the news, the word of Jesus had spread across the region. It had spread from Galilee to Judea to uh, J Jerusalem and then all over. And the Bible even says that the power of the Lord was present to heal. We know that Jesus, he calls the dumb to speak, he calls the deaf to hear, the blind to see. He called the lame to walk, and, and he even rose the dead. And, and the power of the Lord was present to heal. When we also see in these scriptures that we're just reading, that Jesus was found in this house. He was found here. Jesus was in this house. And this house was used as a place to bring sinners in connection to know the Savior. Isn't it good that Jesus showed up at this house? Something good always happens when Jesus shows up. This is proof right here that salvation can happen in a house. Doesn't just to ha it just doesn't only happen in a church. It happens in churches. happens in churches a lot. But salvation happened in this house, and it can happen in your house. Salvation, we've seen salvation happen in schools, haven't we, Miss Joy? We, listen, I've seen, personally, I've seen salvation happen on a street corner. Salvation can happen in a prison. Sal salvation can happen in a nursing home. Salvation can happen in a hospital. It just doesn't only happen in churches. It happened in this house. Let's look at the Savior. Now we're going to be, we're going to look at the Savior. The Savior was sent by the Father to win the sinner. Then we're going to look at the saboteurs, those who were standing in the way of salvation. Then we're going to look at the soul winners, these friends who were seeking to bring the wretched to the Savior. And then we're going to look at the sinner, you know, the one who needed the Lord, who didn't know the Lord. He couldn't get to the Lord on his own, spreading out. After he gets saved, he's spreading the word about the Savior. And then we'll see the spectators. All oh, those that were gathered in the house, they were shocked. They were amazed about what happened um, when he met the Savior. So here, during Jesus' earthly ministry, we see that many miracles were done. Now, there's numerous, numerous verses that tell us why Jesus came. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. There's numerous verses, but I want to give you a couple. We can look at Luke 19 and verse 10, John 3, 16, and 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. The scripture tells us here that Jesus came to save sinners. The great, there were miracles that happened here that this uh, lame man gets up after he is saved and healed. And he gets up, he carries, he carries his couch, and he even goes back into his house glorifying and praising God. 
But this first thing that Jesus looked at, let's look at verse 20 here. That Jesus says here, and when he had saw their faith, so these men who had lowered this man into the, through, the, through the roof there, lowers him in to the house there. Jesus saw uh, their faith there, and he says right here, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Notice, Jesus deals with the most important, vital, crucial thing first. He deals with the sin factor. He deals with this man's sin, and then, then he deals with the physical sickness. The most important thing, the most important thing, is not the healing of the body. The most important thing is the salvation of his soul. Now, none of us like to go through ailments and illnesses and sicknesses and all those things. I don't like a headache. It seems like when my head is aching, it affects everything. It not only affects me, it, sometimes it can even affect surroundings. In other words, I can affect others. Upon the headache here, to, to heal this man's body again, it would have made him more comfortable. And in life, church, we all want to be comfortable, don't we? But without the healing of this man's sin soul here, he would have died and he would have faced a righteous God in judgment. His main need was the forgiveness of sins, and he received it. We're all faced with health, emotional, and financial crisis, which, which Jesus can solve all these. But those same problems that people have, health, emotional, uh, uh, all those needs that people have, it should be that it drives them to the Savior for refuge and for salvation, for the needs being met. We also see here that there were some who were causing problems. There were some who were standing in the way. Let's look at verse 19 and verses 21 and 23. The Bible says, and when they, this is the four, the, the men here, when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the what? The multitude. This is a packed house. It was standing room only. And to let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. Let's look at verses 21 and 23. This, this is concerning the scribes and the Pharisees. Begin to reason, saying, who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus perceived their thoughts, and he answered to them, While well, reason ye in your hearts, whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. And here, this crowd, this, this crowd here, the location where our Lord is at, this crowd had traveled up to 80 miles, 80 miles, to hear Jesus speak. And again, this house was packed. It was filled. The men initially in their attempt to get their sick friend to Jesus, they tried to go through the door. But they couldn't get in the door. They couldn't even budge to get in the door. And here was a man who was truly, truly in need to see Jesus. They couldn't get him in there. This They, they could have missed it. They could have missed it. Um, which tells me, you know, if they would have given up, if they would have just given up and gone home, it tells me that there can be some times people can be in a church service and they didn't come to receive anything. They were just there to show up. Which means that if, if they choose to stay that way, they can miss out on a blessing. And that's why in the, in, in the beginning when I told you, Jesus is in a place and people are come ready to seek and to receive they will be filled these scribes and Pharisees begin to reason among themselves in other words they begin to ask they begin to incite amongst one another here and we see they're asking this question well who can forgive sins only God can forgive sins and you know what they're right only God can forgive sins. And the Pharisees, when the Lord said, told this man, thy sins are forgiven, their little Pharisaical antennas popped up. 
And they began to question and they began to incite amongst other other. And they wanted to bring up a ruckus, a riot amongst in this place, rather than allowing the Lord to have his perfect will and way in this service. These religious leaders thought in their warped theology, they thought that sin causes all illnesses. If a person's sick, well, what have they done wrong? What, what, is, what has happened here? But the issue of the challenge was this church, the deity of Christ. Because yes, only God can forgive sins. Only God can heal. And the religious leaders are speaking of Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh, is speaking of Him being a blasphemer. They did not understand. They did not see. They did not know Jesus like we know Jesus. Knowing that Jesus is the Son of God. God in flesh. Jesus came and died on the cross of Calvary more than 2,000 years ago. He shed His blood so that our sins could be forgiven. He died on the cross of Calvary but three days later, he glorious and triumphantly rose again from the grave. The ones that were truly suffering in this house, <clears throat> yes, there were crowds there that were wanting to receive and learn from Christ, but there were also saboteurs who were standing in the way of wanting what was done. The true people who were crippled were the scribes and the Pharisees, church. They were the true ones that were suffering. They were paralyzed with a critical spirit. They were paralyzed with a lack of love. They were par paralyzed with unbelief. These Pharisees were spiritually crippled. They could have easily hindered this man's chance of getting to see Jesus. They were apathetic. They were indifferent. They were lethargic. They were lazy. This lets me know I don't ever want to get to the place in my life. And I don't ever want you to get to the place in your life where we ever take serving the Lord for granted, living for God for granted, getting to, getting to bless people, getting to encourage people, getting to glorify God. We don't ever take that for granted. You know, we're kind of just in church where we're kind of just, just, you know, just, just barely in the service. Let's don't ever, ever take that for granted. Here we see that these men here, let's look at verses 18, 19, and 20. We're seeing these men here. These men who are determined, these soul winners here. In verse 18, and when, behold, when men brought in a bed, which was taken with palsy, and they sought means to bring him in to lay him before Jesus. They just wanted to get their friend to Jesus. Verses 19. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of what? The multitude. They went upon the housetop. Now in, in these homes here, in your, your average home in the area, um, there is going to be a home that's about in Capernaum. It's about fifty. If, if, if in other words, if, if we were having a gathering in a home in Capernaum in this day, standing up now and packed in, you could fit, fit. Watch this: fifty people in a home. Now the roof, the roof system there was slightly, just slightly tilted. In other words, if rains or storms were coming off. It wouldn't uh, set up there. It would just slowly drain off. And here what these men do in verses 19 we read, while they couldn't find what means to bring him up by the door, they went upon the housetop. So they went upon the roof. And the roof there, uh, which we have either uh, metal roofing or uh, shingles, but here they have like tile roofings. And what, they, what happens is, if you can picture this, here is Jesus teaching and preaching. He's in the middle of a service. And all of a sudden, while he's teaching and preaching, out comes the tiles. 
And these towels are being removed. And these four men begin lowering this sick man, their friend, before Jesus. Now, this is something that's wonderful. I don't see recorded in the scriptures Jesus ever says something where he has this attitude. Excuse me, I'm preaching here. You're interrupting what's taking place. You see, while I'm preaching to you, the Holy Spirit, the true teacher, is speaking to you. And some things that I'm showing you from what he showed me and, it's, and, and through the hours this week of studying this, there are some things that he is wanting to show you as well. So here they bring in this man here and because they couldn't find another way uh, because of the, the multitude at the door. I'm so thankful that these men didn't give up. Uh, these, these, these men here uh, we don't know their names. We don't know their ages. I don't think they were preachers. I don't think they were prophets. I don't think they were uh, apostles that we would see about uh, in, in other books. I don't think that they ever wrote a word of inspiration. But Christ saw their faith. Christ was pleased by their faith and their actions. He, he honored their faith and their efforts here. They knew this, that if they could get their friend to Jesus, Jesus could help them. Because they, they cared about this sick man. They were concerned about, their sick, about this sick man. And they put their faith to action. They were compelled to deliver him to the Savior. They weren't going to let discouragement keep them from getting to Jesus. Not by the crowd at the door and not by the rooftop above. They could have said this when they went through the door. Do you see that crowd? I mean, we'll never get in there. They could have said the timing's just not right. I mean, we, could, we should have came earlier. Uh, they could have said this. You know, it, it, Jesus is too busy. But no. They pressed on. Now, what if this would have been Peter's house? <laughs> we know how Peter was. If it had probably been someone's house like Peter, they'd have probably said, now wait a minute, before you go tearing the talent on my house, let me call Jake from State Farm. You know, I mean, this is serious here. Now, no, they knew that they needed to get this into Jesus. A soul is worth it all. Very valuable. They didn't quit or give up. They knew that today was a day of salvation. Now, it's our responsibility, it's our duty to continue to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's different ways of doing this. Boy, they're sharing notes that you get, they're sharing your own faith, there's tracks. Uh, we got media. With, there's all kinds of ways now that we can share our faith with others. It's our responsibility. Now, the one you tell, the one that you speak to about Christ, it's up to them to decide what they do with what you've told them. We can't make, we can't force anybody into it. We can just share it with them. But here we see, church, it was a team effort, wasn't it? These four men didn't discourage one another along the way. They took this man to Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, the scripture says, I planted, Apollos watered. Notice this. We see here, Paul says, I have planted, Apollos, what? Watered. But who gave the increase? It was God. It was God that gave that increase. It's a team effort. And really, that's what it takes most of the time. You doing a part, some others will do another part, but God 
gives the increase. And that's the main thing, is just getting the person to Jesus. And that's why I'm not, and I know you're not, we're not jealous about getting the credit. Let me say it this way. You may do something for a person. You might share your faith with them. Someone else might buy them groceries. Someone else might help them in another area of their life. And someone else may lead them, personally lead them, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what that person might do? They might join a church that didn't involve any of those other people. We've seen those kinds of things happen. But it, it's all a team effort, what God uses here. And I, I'm, oh, I'm reminded, you know, even those uh, who come in the, the fall and the winter months, snowbirds, uh, people watching um, right now in Indiana, people watching in Missouri, um, people watching um, in, in the Philippines, people watching in India right now, people praying and supporting the efforts of the work that we do here. Next we see the center, the spreading of the word about the Savior. This man had a sin-crippled soul. According to Romans chapter 3 and verse 11, he couldn't get to Jesus. By the way, this is a sin-fractured world that we live in, church. And here, he couldn't get to Jesus on his own. These friends helped get this man to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the important thing was the healing of his sin soul. The forgiveness of his sins. You can get to heaven and have a sick body, but you can't get to heaven without your sins being pardoned. And that is what this person needed. And when this person was told by Jesus that his sins were forgiven, church, this is what this man did. On his back. This man on his couch. Now Matthew and Mark call it a bed. Luke called it a couch. When Jesus said, Arise, man, thy sins be forgiven thee. Arise, take up. Thy bed and walk. Understand, this man simply was obedient to the Lord. He did exactly what Jesus told him to do. He picked up his couch and he began to walk and go home exactly what Jesus told him to do. He was obedient in his the command that the Lord told him to do. He was obedient. So he took his couch and he walked home. And his couch was his testimony. This is what happened to him. He's no longer crippled. He can now walk. It was something that happened immediately. Just like salvation, it happened immediately. And the couch is the very thing that symbolized defeat and fear in this man's life. And now he has rolled it up. And he has taken it and he is telling others about what happened to him. He's departed, and he's spreading the word about the Savior. These changed life, the changed life of this man, it caused amazement amongst the crowd. The fact that this paralyzed man did get up, pick up his couch, not only caused the crowd to marvel, but they gave glory to God. It blew any argument of any skepticism concerning the Lord's ability to forgive this man and heal this man. They watched Jesus forgive this man and heal this man. And what the Lord did for this man, saving his soul, that is the business that Jesus came to do. Church, we know this. Any lack of obedience, simply any disobedience, hinders a person from doing what God intends a person to do. But the Lord frees us. He 
frees us. Just as he freed this man from this bed here. He gives us the authority to take up our beds and walk. Today, the word that the Lord has spoken to you, will you be obedient to Him? Will you do what He's asked you to do? Lord, would you kindle a fire in our hearts? Would you continue to compel us at such a time as this to continue to share our faith with others because behind every heart is a, per is, is a soul that needs to be reached for the glory of God. Remember this, judgment comes to everybody. Let's stand to our feet, church. Let's uh, mind the Lord this morning.